Welcome to the ICE 365 WRB series in partnership with IMGL. Uh, today, we've got the WRB Regulatory Futures panel, where we'll be talking about regulatory trends in the sector. I'm Andy Danson. I'm a member of the IMGL, as well as being head of the international gambling practice at Bird & Bird. Um, today, I'm going to be joined for our session by my fellow IMGL members from some of the key jurisdictions where regulatory changes are impacting the strategic planning, uh, the share prices and the bottom lines of gambling businesses around the world. To discuss the Nordics, we're going to be joined by Morten Ronda, the managing partner of Nordic Gambling in Denmark. From Germany, we have Dr. Matthias Spitz, a senior partner at Melchers. Uh, from the Netherlands, we'll have Frank Tolboom, a partner at Calf Cats in France. And last, but very definitely not least, we'll have Marie Jones, the co-chair of the gaming practice group at Fox Rothschild, to give us some hopefully happier news for the industry from the US. Uh, Thank you all very much for, for joining us. Um, I, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it, and I think really uh, we couldn't be in better hands. Um, so on to, I think, the main topic of today's session. Um, as it says in, in the billing for the panel, regulation is getting tougher in mature regulated markets for the industry. We've got newer regulated markets, well, at, at least in Europe, uh, which are proving rather less hospitable, perhaps, than some may have hoped for the industry. Um, and of course, we have gambling regulatory authorities uh, certainly cracking down on the industry with greater force and, and regularity. Um, so today we'll be looking at some of those trends uh, and also indulging in a little bit of crystal ball gazing into what the regulatory future for the industry might look like. I thought that we would start off by looking at some of the trends uh, in some of Europe's more mature regulated markets uh, with Morton, uh, then go on to the newly regulating markets of Germany and the Netherlands with Matthias and, and with Frank, and then hopefully lightening the mood a little bit when we'll be joined by Marie uh, with some more positive news from the US, which we all know has become something of a beacon of optimism and, and obviously for investment in the industry. So to start off um, then with, um, with Great Britain, my, my own jurisdiction, I think it is no secret that the operators and, and the industry in, in the sector have been feeling uh, increasing regulatory heat uh, for some time. Certainly um, over the last three years or so, we have seen um, a real trend of, of tightening regulation and that has manifested itself in, in a huge increase in, in the frequency and the size of, of gambling commission uh, fines and regulatory settlements, which keep setting new records and, and in some cases are into eight figures um, at a time. Um, we've seen a ban on credit cards for, for gambling, tightening of the rules um, around VIP um, or high value customer um, programs. Uh, we've seen increasing expectations in relation to customer interaction by operators um, and almost sort of de facto um, affordability um, checking. We've also got, um, with effect from uh, October this year, uh, we've got um, changes in respect of game design, so around minimum spin speeds, around well, bans on autoplay and, and spin stop uh, features. We've got bans on, uh, a, well, a ban on reverse withdrawals um, coming in. Um, and that is just the Gambling Commission side of things, as, as I think um, the market is, is very aware. We have already kicked off a review of the Gambling Act um, in Great Britain, which underpins um, almost all gambling regulation um, in this jurisdiction. Um, and whilst at the moment it is really too early to say with any degree of, of certainty what sort of changes that might bring in, um, I think it is safe to say that it is likely to deliver tighter regulation. Um, and, and some of the areas that, uh, that DCMS and, and the government are, are looking at um, and are seeking uh, evidence on is potential further restrictions on advertising and sponsorship for, for the industry. Um, I think we're very likely to see a, a crackdown on white label arrangements. Um, there's been talk of stake limits on, on online slots to, um, in the minds of some, bring them into line with the offline industry. 
Um, there is talk of, of an ombudsman, which seems to be garnering quite a lot of support from, from the industry as a consumer redress scheme. Um, the, the Gambling Commission itself has, has come in for a lot of criticism recently, and so um, we'll be looking uh, into, or rather the review will be looking into, um, the powers and, and the resources um, of the Gambling um, Commission. Um, and perhaps most significantly, um, there will, or there is very likely to be uh, a more in-depth look at this issue of affordability um, and perhaps debate at a government and, and parliamentary level um, about um, really the extension of gambling regulation into this area of requiring um, adult citizens to um, prove that they can afford to gamble uh, above potentially um, reasonably modest levels um, before being um, permitted to um, spend their money um, on um, on gambling, um, which um, is is a fascinating debate on on a number of levels that I, I could spend the whole of this session probably talking about, but we have time only for a uh, a whistle to whistle stop tour. So, uh, without further ado. Um, I will um, hand over to, to Morten uh, to tell us about the experience in the Nordics and, and how that compares to uh, what we're seeing elsewhere in the world. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. I'll try to wrap up the Nordics in, uh, in three minutes, which is uh, not easy. Uh, if I start out, uh, so there are four jurisdictions I want to mention. I will leave out uh, Iceland because Iceland is not uh, that interesting in terms of gambling. I'll speak about Denmark, Norway, uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway, and Finland in in that order. And it was it was very interesting to to hear what you were telling about the experience in the UK because, uh, unfortunately, what happens in the UK often happens a year or or so later in uh, in Denmark. So, the the regulators, the politicians, the media are following the uh, the chain of events in 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 the UK and. They are considering uh, things that are already in place in the UK, such as whistle to whistle ban in uh, on advertising throughout football matches and restrictions on TV commercials and things like that. It's fair to say that um, that Denmark is a mature market, it's working fine, it's a workable jurisdiction, but things are getting more difficult for the industry. There's been a massive uh, tax increase uh, recently. Uh, there was uh, restrictions on marketing and the government is uh, looking into further restrictions on marketing. Uh, fortunately, it has been on hold, but it will come back. And uh, the current government we have is a left-wing government, so very skeptical of, of gambling as, uh, as such. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the only positive I can say is that I think the government is aware that there's only so, so much you can tighten the screws uh, without losing the market. Uh, and uh, and they they're actually aware that there's a balance. Um, if we uh, if we go to Sweden, Sweden is a fairly new market in terms of licensing. They only started licensing in 2019. Uh, the market started with a boom, uh, with 100 plus uh, operators being uh, licensed and uh, crazy advertising, and uh, seemingly a government who never understood what it was that they'd catered for. Um, so there's been uh, a massive debate in Sweden. Uh, there's been lots of clampdowns from the regulators. Massive uh, fines have been issued, and uh, yeah, a lot of turmoil and and operators pulling out or not knowing if they should pull out. Is it too risky? I feel that it's calming uh, now, but uh, the government is still planning on uh, on further uh, restrictions on on advertising and on other issues. So, um, and we're not uh, we're not quite uh, home safe uh, there yet. Uh, so, let's uh, let's see what happens. If we turn to uh, to Norway and Finland, those are monopolies, uh, and they maintain their monopolies, and they vigorously enforce them and both uh, well Norway has been vigorously enforcing a payment block for for years and they are continuing down that route and they're really uh, they also trying now to to uh, to block actual uh, uh, what you say broadcasts with um, with uh, commercials from foreign uh, foreign uh, foreign TV companies 
Um, so, uh, so there's no hope for for licensing there within the next, I'd say, five years. Uh, they they have to exhaust all their possibilities of uh, enforcing their monopoly. Uh, the same goes to Finland. Finland has had a very passive approach to uh, to uh, to enforcing the gambling system, and you should know that that the Finns. Uh, are really those in Europe who play most per per capita. So it's a very uh, it's a very profitable jurisdiction, and I think that many operators are liking their operation there, even though they can't get a license. But now they've started to to get uh, letters from the authorities, and the authorities are starting to consider things like ISP blocks and 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 payment blocks. And uh, so again, I think we'll see. Uh, for the next uh, few years, we'll see the uh, the regulator trying to enforce the monopoly as much as they can, and maybe if it fails, we'll see that they will another route for for licensing. Thanks very much, Morten. I think that's a that's a fantastic summary. And I think what was particularly interesting is the different approach to that balance between a an attractive regulated market and 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 a, a properly functioning regulated market and um the um the alternative um and, and i think that is is perhaps a, a good moment and a good thought um to move over to matthias um and germany um to uh, to tell us about um the the new regime there because germany is obviously such a huge market for um a number of of online operators and um you know i think i think the, the challenges and, and the impact of, of what's going on in, in Germany is, is as big as, as as anywhere in Europe. So, Matthias, over to you. Thank you, Andy. I think, uh, in short, I can say that Germany continues to be a mystery maze for operators. You go into a licensing process, you don't know when you come out, where, or if at all. So, the um, main trends that have been relevant to the, the German uh, gambling market have, have obviously been the licensing proceedings and that also points into the future i'll speak about that shortly um starting with the new regulation that came into force uh, january last year which also started a licensing process um the some of the audience may know that the process was halted for almost half a year due to transparency reasons and then um over the past um uh, nine months or so licenses have been um, issued step by step with uh, li the last licenses actually as late as uh, in in June 2021. Um, a total of 35 sports betting licenses has been issued until June um, 2021. So th there is some progress, but um, the licensing process and the underlying regulations have been characterized by very challenging conditions. Interestingly, there's some um, uh, seemingly some inspiration that German regulators took from neighboring countries. We also have now ad advertising regulations, for example, a whistle to whistle uh, ban um, for advertising sports betting. And there's also, for example, a requirement of, of affordability checks in the licenses when a player wants to ask for a limit increase. So there's, it's you can see there is some inspiration from from other countries there um now the the key change that has happened is just two weeks ago when the interstate treaty 2021 came into force where the sports betting licensing process will be continued albeit with some changes there is a new supervisory uh, system supposed to come uh into uh into effect at some point the timings are not fully clear uh, operators can uh, interface uh, to, to a sandbox testing system up until now, um, which uh, then is supposed to uh, go live at some point and uh, ensure that there is an overarching um, limit uh, restrictions in place so that players just don't gamble away too much. Um, and there's, what we already have is a, is a national player bearing database. So very strict and tight um, uh, technical supervision, which also raises uh, issues under data protection laws. Um, with the new entry into force of, of this, this new regulation, uh, also came a regulation for a new licensing process in, for slots and poker. Uh, in the internet, um, that started on the 1st of July, so it's, it's possible to submit license applications, though um, it's um, uh, it, it's been from my point of view, a bit of a, I would say a bumpy start because there, there's not much 
a communication from the regulator side yet. So you can see they're still in the process of building up uh, the, the, the new regulator as they go with the new licensing process. And the third, uh, and this would be the, my, my three main points here, third point would be the new um, tax for slots and poker that also came into force on the 1st of July. Uh, which is unfortunately a turnover tax of 5.3%. So that, that is, mm, you could say, um, almost prohibitive. Um, and uh, we, we came from a place where only VAT applied up until now uh, onto uh, slots and, and poker revenues and on a GGR basis. And the tax rate was 19%. So actually quite convenient for the industry. And now we have that 5.3% on turnover meaning stakes not ggr and i think that will have a chilling effect uh on the market um it, it there doesn't seem to be a really a big buzz around the new licensing system as of yet so it might be mainly the big players who go for these licenses and i think that that is kind of the, the picture that we see at the moment and um yeah so we'll it, it continues to be a challenge but at least you know we're gradually moving forwards with with the regulation. Uh, thanks very much, Matthias. And and there are uh, uh, so so many questions. Uh, I, I think um, in in relation to uh, to that process and and that tax rate. That again, we could uh, uh, we we could spend uh, as long as we uh, as, as long as we liked on. But unfortunately, um, let's move on um, to the Netherlands. Who um, I, Frank, I'm, I'm sorry to leave you waiting until this moment, but uh, the Netherlands have, of course, left the industry waiting nearly 15 years for um, this uh, this promised regulation, which appears now to be happening to uh, uh, to great um, fanfare. So uh, please do tell us all about it. Yes, thank you, Andy. As you know, uh, indeed, at conferences for more than 10 years, we've been saying, yes, next year the market is going to open up. Well, I'm uh, very pleased to say that it finally happened. So on uh, the 1st of April, the new law entered uh, into force. And the first uh, applications were also uh, submitted by uh, actually 28 operators. Uh, <clears throat> so what, what's, what's on the table and how do we compare it with other markets? I think, as most of you know, I think our regulatory framework aligns, I think the most with the Danish system. So there's an open licensing system, B2C only, no B2B licenses. Most of the product verticals are being regulated. 29% uh, uh, tax rate on GGR, no turnover, it's GGR. Uh, <clears throat> and rel relatively flexible and technologically neutral regulation. So <clears throat> it's all looking good. And uh, we also see a clear interest for the, for the Dutch market, especially now the German market is a little bit more uh, complicated uh, nowadays. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, in terms of timelines, uh, in April, the, the, the first so-called batch of applications were submitted. And we do expect that uh, more will follow. There, will, there are no licensing windows, but um, operators have been on the market already. They need to so-called cool off. So. Uh, operators, uh, .com operators need to show that they've behaved for 33 months. Uh, and that behavior means they should not have specifically targeted Dutch market. And most of the usual suspects uh, are compliant and probably are able to apply in uh, Q3 or Q4 of this year. And then we expect another 50 to 60 operators uh, on the Dutch market. In terms of trends, I think we also follow the same path as Denmark, I would say, also with a very strong incumbent operator in the Netherlands, which also still is being protected by the government. They also get a head start. They will go live in October, whereas all of the others have to wait for a little bit more. There's still also a number of other protective measures in place. They still have the monopoly for the, the lottery market, so they could try to cross-sell their products, exactly what has uh, happened in Denmark, I think. Um, and finally, also what's interesting uh, that Martin mentioned, well, what happens in the UK happens two years later in Denmark, but what happens in the Netherlands 
what happens in Denmark happens two years later in the Netherlands. <laughs> so we're a bit slower, uh, but at least that it will also give some time for operators uh, to prepare and adapt to the situation. Thank you very much for, for that, Frank. And actually, I'm, I'm not sure that direction of regulatory travel only goes one way around Europe. I, I think what, what I can see is that almost all jurisdictions are now looking at other jurisdictions and, and taking inspiration. And, and I don't, I certainly don't think we can say that there is typically one leader and, and, and one follower. I know um, certainly in, in Britain we are um, uh, or, or the Gambling Commission uh, and certainly our politicians and, and media seem to be looking at, uh, at various jurisdictions for, for inspiration, shall we say. Um, but thank you very much for, for that, Frank. It's great to see um, the, the Netherlands um, coming online in, in a regulated um, way. Um, so I'm moving on to revert to our European panel. I thought we would indulge in a final little bit of crystal ball gazing. Um, so Morton and Matthias and Frank, uh, please give us uh, your key takeaway for what the regulatory future holds in your jurisdiction. So Morton, over to you. Please uh, give us some predictions for the Nordics. Yeah, I'm. I think I'm moderately optimistic for for the Nordics. I think when it comes to Sweden and Denmark, I think usually they're very pragmatic uh, countries. So I think they will find that balance in terms of, of regulation and protection of the market eventually. Uh, so let's hope that they will, uh, that they will not do what they have done before, just drive uh, con the consumers out of the market. Um, when it comes to uh, Finland and Norway, they have driven the consumers out of the market, half of them. So I, I am positive that down the line, they will they will have to switch their their monopolies for for licensing systems. That's the only viable way uh, for me. But uh, yeah, it's not just around the corner. It's uh, it's a few years from now. Thanks, Morton and uh, Matthias. Is the uh, is the new regime and, and in particular the tax rate going to be sustainable? I think that there will be a part of the market that will be able to work with it. Um, at some point, I think the trend will be to lower the RTP um, to be able to, to deal with the tax. And we will see sooner or later tax enforcement so that it will be necessary for operators to uh, um, comply with, with the new taxes. I think there's no, no way around that. And that also will entail a decision on whether to apply for a license. So it's, it's time to decide whether to, to uh, continue in the German market or move on. Um, well, there's one slight upside of this new text. There's some language in the new text legislation which confirms that as uh, esports is um, uh, an permissible betting. So that's actually something, a uh, kind of interesting area where we might see some positive developments in that esports e betting may be permitted soon. That's what I would hope for. Um. Thanks very much, uh, Matthias. So, Frank, over to you. Yeah, I'm actually quite uh, quite optimistic. Uh, like I mentioned before, already 28 applications were submitted. We do expect at least 50 to 60 more. Uh, the government is aiming for an 80% generalization rate, which would, uh, should work. Uh, and Yes, in the, the next three years, because then there will be an evaluation of the market, we'll see uh, what the current status is. But uh, we don't have a government uh, currently, so I think this is also good news. So no new regulatory uh, developments. And uh, yeah, again, there's a clear interest for the Dutch market. Obviously, there will be heavy advertising once the market opens up. So we have to see how Parliament responds. Uh, there will be not a backlash, as we also have seen in the UK, but so far, uh, yeah, we're actually quite, the uh, future is quite bright. That's, uh, that's good, good to hear. Um, and I think from, from the British perspective, um, I think my, my hope is that what we will see with the Gambling Act review will be what is promised, which is an evidence-based approach to policy making, um, and, um, and and I hope uh, a balance to be struck um, between um, the increasing uh, regulation and the need to maintain a, a functioning market. And I and I think um, uh, 
Britain has a has a long history of, of having achieved that, and I, I think that will continue to be the case. But I don't think there is any doubt that um, the, the future holds um, tighter regulation of, of some kind um, in Great Britain. And now, happily, four becomes five. Um, I am looking forward to welcoming Marie to our panel, and I'm hoping that we can now deliver uh, some more positive news. Now, unlike Germany and the Netherlands, which were treated, um, of course, as generally as grey markets prior to regulation, um, the US has been essentially off limits to operators before the state by state opening up of regulated markets that we've been uh, witnessing. Um, so it's almost all upside for operators on, on that front. Uh, so Marie, um, welcome to the panel. They are definitely different from what we're seeing in Europe right now. Uh, the US market continues to grow. It's um, basically in the past, there has not been as much online either sports or casino in the United States as there has been in Europe. So with the pandemic and with certain of the court decisions, online began to grow and be legalized, regulated in the U.S. Um, and now that states are looking for ways to enhance tax revenue and they're seeing other states that are actually regulating it properly, they are introducing legislation. So we've seen a tremendous growth in the last year in the United States for both online sports, online casino, and actually land-based casino as well. That being said, there is still the concern with issues like problem gaming, and the regulators are very conscious of that. Each state takes it in a different direction. Some states have where you have um, bet limits, other states do not have that, but there's always an enhanced um, review and they always look for problem gaming issues and they actually have certain criteria that they want their operators to, to look at as well. So while it's we're definitely in a growth mode in the US, uh, there is there is still restriction and the companies and the regulators are conscious of the issues. Um, thanks. And, and how much consistency are you seeing across different states um, in that respect? So for operators who are looking to um, access the, the U.S. On, on a multi-state basis, how much are they able to, to take a consistent approach to their um, operational model? I it's a challenge. Uh, each jurisdiction is different, even if it is from a cost perspective. So, uh, you know, you look at Tennessee, their licenses were very expensive, but Virginia much less. Um, each state's different on the limit of licenses, whether you need to be tied into a land-based casino. From a truly like license process, uh, each state is also different there. The, the information ultimately is the same, so that does help the companies. But, you know, whether you have to do it online, whether you do the multi-jurisdictional form, and again, whether you need to partner and have a skin as opposed to going direct. So it's, it's definitely a challenge to um, see what each piece of legislation looks like and what the regulatory scheme looks like in each jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, and given that this is the, the regulatory futures uh, panel, have you got any predictions for the direction of travel for, um, for gambling regulation in the U.S.? We're going to see a lot of growth. Um, there is definitely going to be more states coming online and quickly. Uh, the regulation, I think, is going to be Similar to what is already in place, I, I don't think you're going to see res more restrictions coming on anytime soon in the U.S. Like you're going, to, like you're seeing the trend in Europe. It's it's sort of opposite, directly opposite. Um, well, that um, to me would be a great place to uh, to wind up. You heard you heard it here. Lots of growth and not too many more restrictions. So uh, I'm glad we can at least say that for some part of the world.